important. Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately called IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association, and you can find more information about IPA World by visiting their website at ipaworld.org. As part of our efforts to promote play, we've introduced Porch Play Chats, which are conversations on a variety of topics with people who are just as passionate about play as we are. I'm Deb Lawrence, and I'm the president of IPA USA. And you can find more about IPA USA by going to our website. And then up in that top right-hand corner, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or be a friend on our Facebook page. And every Monday, magically, a new porch play chat will appear for you. Joining me on the porch today is Lisa Murphy. Good morning, Hello. afternoon, wherever we are in wherever the world. Wherever we are. And Peter Pugalongo. Peter um, is like, you know, here, here's everything we know about Peter. He has over 30 years of experience as an author, a training and technical assistant provider, a program evaluator, a Head Start and Child Care Agency administrator, and teacher, and um, and uh, uh, he worked at NAYC in the professional development area. He, you know, Peter, he's uh, was the vice president of the Delaware Association for the Education of Young Children. He's held positions at training and technical assistance coordinators at the National Center for Childhood Education. So. You got to listen to Peter. He knows his <laughs> stuff. And so today, Peter's going to talk to us about the ethics of supporting play. So ethics and the code of ethical conduct is such an important resource within AYC. So what's the relationship, Peter, between supporting play and the early topic code of ethical conduct? Good Good question, Deb. And great question. Um, you, know, I've been, you know, it's been interesting because I've been a proponent for for children uh, children's right to play and using play as a strategy for teaching in early childhood ed. And I've also been um, president of the fan club of the NAYC Code of Ethical Conduct. I'm not really the president actually, because there are two co-authors uh, of, the, of the code working with NAYC, Stephanie Feeney and Nancy Freeman. And I had the privilege to work with them over many years in revisions to the code and development of some supplements. So when I thought about, you know, how, how can I put these two together? Um, and it, it, was a, it was a very interesting little homework assignment I gave to myself. So we, we, know that, we know that we need to have professional ethics, all professions. It's part of the definition of a profession is that you have a code of ethical conduct. Um, our code in, in, in early childhood, it's a voluntary code. Um, and uh, it offers this framework for uh, what we need to do that is right, that, it, that is appropriate. Um, it, it, it helps us to understand the moral commitments of our profession. And so that, that's very important. Um, it helps us to know how to act, what to do based on the values and ideals that, that gu guide our early childhood educators in our work. And it also provides guidance in dealing with some of the ethical dilemmas that, that do come mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, so as, as, I, as I did my homework and I, and I want to tell you about some of the uh, pieces that I found in the code that are highly related to and encouraging and supporting play, um, you know, I found, well, gee, it's very, it's, it's even more, play is even more uh, uh, ra raised up um, in the Code of Ethical Conduct than I, than I initially even thought. Um, so actually, uh, those of you who've seen me do training know that I'm always surrounded by pieces of paper. So um, I have seven pages of, of pieces of the code that are related to, to play. Um, so you know, the bottom line is we have an ethical responsibility to support play by young children. And, and, you know, and I think of supporting play in two ways. One is every child has a right to play. Um, globally, every child has a right to play. And then in early childhood education, we use play as the primary strategy for teaching, for primary strategy for, for children's learning. So it's important to see both pieces of it. And ethically, we need to support both pieces of it as well. Um, 
can I do it? Can I, I feel like I need to give a little primer on what's in the code. I'll try and do this as briefly as possible. Um, I once did a, did a video with Stephanie Feeney on the code and the whole video was supposed to be 10 minutes long. Um, and 70 minutes later, we were <laughs> still talking. So now there are seven videos on <laughs> parts, part one, part two, et cetera. So, um, so the code, let's see if I can, Oh, no. Yeah, there, okay, there no. it is. No, no, oh, <laughs> had to be in the other room. Okay, that was the code, okay. <laughs> there it is. So the code has several pieces. There's a preamble that says, this is what the code is, and, and this is who, who it's for. And it's for, the code itself is for all who directly work with young children and, and their families. Um, there are two supplements to the code I'll, I, I might mention later uh, for other uh, professionals in our, in our field. So there's the preamble, the code identifies the core values of our profession. And, um, and then it, it notes, what are our responsibilities to each of our clients? Our responsibilities to children, our ethical responsibilities to families, to our colleagues, which includes our employers, and to community and society. And interestingly, I found more uh, references to play in that last one, in responsibilities to community and society. And that really makes sense because, you know, in early childhood, we're, we're not preparing children for kindergarten. I mean, that's just, you know, yes, that's the next step in their, their uh, group education uh, plans and their programs. Um, but we're preparing them for life to be citizens of this world. And so it makes more sense than that, um, that we're going to look more at what our responsibilities are for, uh, <clears throat> uh, for community and society. So within each section of those responsibilities, there are ideals and principles. So the ideals, they define exemplary professional behavior. It's what we're aiming for. Um, the principles themselves define the responsibilities, things that we must do, things that we can do, and things that we're prohibited from doing. So that's, that's, that's an important piece of it. So starting with the core values, there are seven core values. And the second one, they're not really in uh, priority order, but the second one on the list is, we base our work on knowledge of how children develop and learn. So if you understand child development, um, you understand that uh, children learn with their movement. They learn through questioning, probing, problem solving, et cetera. And all of that are pieces of play that, um, that children learn best when they're provided those opportunities as opposed to sitting and listening. Um, mm -hmm. If you work with young children, you know that they're not very good at sitting and listening for long periods of time particularly if it's a subject that's too obtuse for them, like, you know, the calendar. Um, <laughs> I just thought I'd bring that up. And the weather. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, um, it's a whole, that's a whole nother topic. Another so, topic. Yeah. So, so that's one of the core values. Um, and so we can say, yes, we value children learning through play and ethically we, we need to support that. So when we look at our yeah, but hold on. Oh we yeah, can, <laughs> we can say that till the cows come home. Mm -hmm. How come we don't hold our programs truly accountable to the first item on the code? Well, you know that, and then that gets into what do we do when we have a dilemma, um, which I you know I wanted to get to later, but let's just let's just just dive in. So there's a dilemma. Now I'm I'm a teacher in a program. The code is written for me because I'm working directly with young children. I know that children work best through play, um, and so um, I'm in this program. And somehow it didn't come up in my interview that we're not going to play. Uh, <laughs> who would have thought you need to ask that question in an interview? So you get to the program and then you look in the classroom and there are little tiny desks and all the children are sitting yeah. at the little tiny desks silently. Um, so if, you know, when you're, when you're, I'll say brave enough because, you know, the thing about the code is that um, when, you're, uh, when your back is against the wall, you know, when something's happening that you don't agree with, you know, what we say is the code will help to hold you up. Um, okay. Now, can't necessarily keep you from getting fired, 
but <laughs> maybe you shouldn't be deal. there anyway. So, right? so you look and you go, um, okay, this is what I know. This is a core value of our profession that we teach in the best way that children learn. They learn best through their active involvement through playing. Um, <clears throat> and now you're telling me that I can't do this. Well, there's another principle in the responsibilities to our colleagues that we follow program policies. So now you've got this, this dilemma going on that I, this is what I know is right. And this is what I'm told to do. And according to the code, um, I'm supposed to both do what is right for children and follow program policies. So there's a, there's a way to, to address that. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't know if this, this chart will, uh, well, there's, there's a chart. <laughs> there. There's a chart that so won't help you. I didn't create it. Uh, the chart is in this book, Ethics and the Early Childhood Educator. Um, this is, I think, the third edition published by uh, NAEYC. And it, it says, you know, first, first, is this really an ethical issue you're dealing with? Um, is it a law? Like, you know, if you're in a program and they're telling you don't report child abuse and neglect, well, you follow the law, you know, that's, it's, it's really not even ethical. It's, it's the law. This is what, this is what you do. So then you don't have, to, so you're not really dealing with the code. You're, you're saying, uh, no, I'm a, I'm a mandated reporter, da, da, da. Um, now, if you decide it is something that's ethical, because we've got two conflicting uh, pr principles here. So there's a way to, you know, you look to the code and you see, this is, this is what it tells me. Um, and then there, there's something called ethical finesse. Can you like find a way to deal with this that doesn't set one group against the other group? So if you're in a program and the children aren't playing, um, could you work with your administration to talk about this is how this is how children learn best, and at least part of the day is open for uh, for free play? Um, I was uh, many years ago was when it was when all the the, the state monies for pre K programs in school systems were were beginning to become available, and one of the school systems near me um, they had a large early childhood program including Head Start. And around that same time, um, I think there was federal funding for um, uh, promoting math and science and other academic skills. And then to get this funding, you had to devote 90 minutes to math and 90 minutes to it's either science or, or, um, <clears throat> or language development. And so what programs did, the smart programs, they found a way to, you know, it's nothing new in early childhood education that you're gonna teach academic subjects through children's play, through questioning, probing, et cetera. Um, so what this program did, what this one program did though, was um, they had 90 minutes of direct instruction on math followed by 30 minutes of free play, and then 90 minutes of whatever the other subject matter was, followed by 30 minutes of free play. And so they wanted me to do, do training for them on how to make the most of those 30 minutes of free play. So I think that, that, was, that was ethical finesse. It wasn't the best solution, but it's better than no free play whatsoever. So, you know, and, and so what we did was we talked about um, how you can meet the goals of that, whatever regs were saying needed the 90 minutes, how to meet those goals through, through play. So uh, the program was now armed with some more information. So, um, so ethically, they found a way to address it, not, you know, and that's often what happens when you're dealing with ethics is you, you're never going to make everybody happy at the same time. So everybody was partially happy, <laughs> I, I guess, is, is where we were going. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, one of the other areas where it often comes up, um, where ethics often comes up is, again, we know that um, <clears throat> our responsibilities to children say that we're going to teach them in the way that is most appropriate for the way they learn, etc. And then in responsibilities to families, um, we say we, uh, one of the ideals is we share information about each child's education and development with families, help them to understand and appreciate the current knowledge base of the field. Not a surprise to anyone. A principle is we shall inform families of program philosophy or policies, et cetera, and why we teach as we do. 
and we inform families of uh, what our policies are and involve them in policy decisions. So that's the piece I, I was going for. So if you have, if, you, if your program philosophy and primary strategy for teaching is children learning through play, and then you have families, you have some of the parents are saying the kids are playing too much. So I'm, I'm now involved in your policy making. <laughs> and so I'm saying less play, more teaching, more instruction, more direct in instruction. So you've got those two. So again, ethical finesse would be a way to deal with it. And so you can say, well, this is, you know, we can do training and, and education for parents on this is what we're teaching as children are learning through play, et cetera. That might not work. And so what you might have to do then, and if you're a teacher, um, you know, you're certainly going to need the backing of your administration on this, is say, um, well, I don't think you want to start with, I'm sorry, but your point is, I'm sorry, this is what we do. You know, this is, this is the program. And, you know, you find a better way to say, if you don't like it, you're just going to have to go someplace else. So you can, certainly can't say that, but, the, you know, that's, that's sort of the point. This is what we do in our program. Um, when I was teaching, now this was way, way back when I was teaching preschool, and I had a little girl who came to school every day wearing crenolin. I didn't even know they still made crenolin. This was in the 1970s. <laughs> And um, okay, paint does not come out of Kremlin. In case you were wondering, <laughs> every day in her gorgeous little dress, there was splattered paint because she loved to paint. And the, the father was always very upset and he ended up pulling the kid out of the, out of the program. So, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know if he ever found a program where children don't paint when they're wearing their Kremlin dresses, but, um, but perhaps he did. But you know, and, you know, ethically, this is this is what we do in our program. Children get messy, you know. I don't wear crinoline. I wear I wear blue jeans and t-shirts, so that <laughs> easily washable. Right, and they're not getting messy. Just to just to zone in on to to drill, so to speak, on on that particular example, because I I still think there's an ethical conversation around that. We're not flinging paint. As right. your child, right? Obviously, yeah. but but this is a kind of an organic byproduct of a program that is aligned with best practice that we know we should be providing, right? So there's yeah. there's that conversation there that you know we're not we're not just throwing them out there, um, but you know what I'm saying. Peter, I have one that I when I was a director of an early care and education program, we had children from different ethnicities, right? Well, I would have some parents come in and say, I don't want him playing or her playing in the sandbox because when she gets sand in her hair, it's difficult to get out. And it was because hmm. the children had the type of hair that was it, difficult for it, sand to get oh out yes, of. So I that. said, mm -hmm. okay, so let's figure out how we can compromise here because your child loves the sandbox. Right. And I don't want to say, I'm sorry, you can't play in the sandbox. Can I put a hat on your child when they go in the sandbox? Right. And the parents said, can we, we can try that. But yeah. I really don't want to be spending an hour a night getting sand out of their hair. Yeah. And I said, okay, let's try this first. Now I'll, I'll even t get a hat that has a cute little tie <laughs> underneath of it. Yeah. yeah keeping hats on off. children. Yeah. It's like <laughs> and keeping I'll mask on children. Sure, yes. I'll make sure the teachers know to keep that hat on when the child is in the sandbox. And that worked. Yeah. Because then nobody's compromising. We're not, we're not feeling like we have to make this blanket rule now. We're not feeling that we have to um focus only like you're not allowed to be in the sandbox because that's going to bring up something yeah, yeah. something weird we're not compromising we're meeting them halfway right and is do do folks okay so i have a very general question i didn't find out that nacy had a code of ethics until i was about five or six years into my career mm. mm-hmm and, and now as I've, you know, I'm, I'm not going gray yet, but I sometimes wish I was, <laughs> I, I have found that, that there are some examples that I see in classrooms. Um, and I'm like, you know what, guys, we need to start calling this what it is. You know, you guys have an ethical responsibility to mm -hmm. stay true 
to what we know is not anybody's personal preference for the 99,000th time, but this is what we know best practice looks like. And it's not because that's what I want. It's we've got research, we have evidence, blah, 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 blah. And, and I've started calling it out. And I intentionally, I think, occasionally want it to be a little uncomfortable so that people are willing to turn inward a little bit and have that conversation. Because I think just as though we might find ourselves as more play-based people occasionally finding ourselves in programs that <laughs> somehow <laughs> we accepted a position and then found out that it was not exactly what we thought we were getting <laughs> into ourselves into. But I think also it's the opposite where the program itself for the most part is play-based oriented and best practice oriented. And, and occasionally somebody gave good interview and infiltrated and now thinks that they can run their own little you know, opposite program down at the end of the hall and the, the tables turn a little bit. And then there is that expectation of, you know, kind of bringing somebody on board with, hey, you know, some of the things you're doing, not only are just not best practice, but they're, they're not ethical. Mm -hmm. you no, know, and they fly completely in the face, you know, if and and to use the medical, uh, I think, parallel, which often happens, you know, if we compare ourselves to the med medical community, you know, if, if you as a doctor were found doing something that was against the code of ethics, you could lose your yeah. license. license, like you could yeah. like be never allowed to practice this work ever again. And so when I see uh, occasionally teachers holding on to such outdated practice mm -hmm. like behavior charts and move your clips and time out chairs and even spanking things like that you're just like oh my how has this been allowed to continue yeah. and it just seems to me that if more people were aware of the document we 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 instantly could bring them back to it right and show them yeah. it's not that i don't like you it's not that you know it has nothing to do with that it's look what this says first do no, no. Harm. Oh, harm right and harm can encompass more than just physical, as we mm -hmm. all know. Yeah. And and I mean, both of you have taught, you've taught college too, Peter. Yes, I don't wanna, yeah. yeah. So have you found that through the years that, I mean, is are they taking classes on ethics in early childhood education? And, and would that be a way, not that a taking a class is gonna get everybody like, okay, here yeah. we got it now, but would it help? Well, so, I think in some programs, in some higher ed programs, um, ethics is a distinct course for mm -hmm. the, in the early childhood education uh, major. Um, but I, you know, what all even if that's not the case in your institution, I, you know, it certainly needs to be part of uh, curriculum, uh, part of the yeah. part of your curriculum. Um, one of the things that NEYC did, and when I still worked there, we were, we were sort of looking at our position statements and saying, okay, these are the core position statements. These are the seminal position statements. So the position statement on developmentally appropriate practice, certainly that is one. Uh, the Code of Ethical Conduct is one of the official position statements. Um, there's a newer position statement on equity and diversity, so that's part of the core now. Uh, position statement on professional preparation standards. Um, so, so I think that's one of the things that helps. It says, okay, there's a whole slew of position statements that address a variety of issues. For sure, you have to understand these and follow these. And you know, and I think it's it's upon us as 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 uh, trainers, as faculty, and in in in, in institutions. Um, to make sure that the field knows that this is this is this is the code of ethical conduct. Uh, the code, when it first it was the 1970s, when NAYC first started looking into developing a code, and, and uh, Dr. Lillian Katz had headed that up. Yeah. Um, and so, what they came up with was the statement of commitment, and in many and that still exists. The statement of commitment. It's not part of the code, but it's a statement that in many programs they ask teachers. To, um, to sign it and say, yes, I will abide by the code of ethical conduct. Oh. Yeah, so I think that's one of the things that's helpful. Another thing that's helpful is the code has been, um, it's endorsed by ACEI, ACEI, Association for Childhood Education International, and endorsed by SICA, the Southern Early Childhood Association, and adopted by the National Association for Family Child Care. So, um, so it's, it's, you know, the code is broad relevant, and broad and relevant for 
all types of group settings where young children are cared for and educated. And you know, Peter, you kind of plop that in quickly, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hi, I'm gonna shine a light on it that that it there's room for owners, directors to say, you know what, our program is aligned with it. So including that in the interview process, the onboarding process yeah. is an option. Um, for, for can I throw this out there for people? You don't need to be formally affiliated with NAYC. I would right. imagine oh, right. to align yourself with a, a professional code of ethics. And that, that might yeah, be good yeah. for some people to hear. The, the other you, thing that you mentioned, <laughs> of course, somebody's at the door. Peter and, has a dog. I have two. Peter has a dog. <laughs> Peter, I had an incident with my cat in the last fourth and place. He's, he's very, they're very protective of her. Yeah, they want to make um, sure everything is fine. Oh, I know. Uh, Lisa, when you mentioned about um, about physicians, um, the code for the code of ethical conduct for physicians and attorneys and other professions, um, that code is mandatory. But the, uh, hold on. That's okay. I had a cat issue. <laughs> I had a cat who was making some mistaken had mistaken behavior that I had. <laughs> the dog is acting like yeah. a dog, so it's not inappropriate, but yeah. and he thinks he's protecting me. So where was I? So the difference is in early childhood, our code is voluntary. Voluntary. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And I, probably most professions it is a voluntary. How is, has there been um like would there be a way to have it somehow be mandatory even if you weren't aligned? with a professional association or does that kind of go hand in hand like could other uh, yeah. early childhood could other early childhood age um professions like adopt it and make it mandatory i don't know because uh, the the reason that well, i'm making this part up but um but doctors and attorneys there are state licensing systems for them so my understanding is that their code of ethical conduct is part of their licensing. Okay. Now, um, in early childhood education, we don't have state licensing of, 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 the, of the individuals. We have licensing of the programs. So, um, so I think, you know, and I think with the whole power to the profession movement, I think we're working towards more professionalization of right. the field. And so maybe we can work towards the code of ethical conduct being mandatory. And if you do something that is unethical, you know, there's a hearing, we follow due process and you could lose your license to be an early childhood educator. Um, I'm wondering if there would, and, 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 you know, you have to be careful when you toss stuff like this out, cause then you're going to get an email and somebody wants to, wants you to be on a board. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm saying, you know, as somebody who owned licensed facilities in the past, you know, I'm almost wondering if there's ever been conversation of somehow linking that to the licensing of the program. So by virtue of having a licensed childcare center, then we do have some kind of a mandatory adoption of a code of ethics. And I'm thinking out one of the, you know, one of the things to add on to that, Peter, is that is that in some states who have risk-based licensing because they don't have enough licensing staff. Oh. If, if you are an accredited program, right? You you are not seen as having a a higher risk than some of the other programs who are not accredited. Oh, so already in state licensing, they recognize accreditation as a higher level of quality that doesn't need as many visits. Now, of course, there are days that happen when programs, sometimes weeks, when programs mm -hmm. who may be accredited are not accredited because of you know situations of what's happening but i wonder if there's a way to tie that in that if you sign the code of ethical conduct commitment that oh, also is part, part of, of that risk-based system that they use um i i just know that as a director <clears throat> we did staff training on code of ethical conduct right and we only took it one the principle of children first and we mm -hmm. had a conversation about it right and then we took maybe the next staff meeting or two, we talked about our responsibilities to families. And then a staff meeting or so, we talked about our responsibility to our coworkers. 
And what I found, it was the best problem solving document ever. If a teacher came to me and said, I saw so-and-so do something, I'll say, what does the code say? What do you need to do first, second, third? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me know how that works out. <laughs> you know, this child, blah, 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 what does the code say? For this family, what does the code say? And so we, I mean, I, I had it on my desk. Every classroom had a copy of it in a little booklet form in their cupboard. And I would say, go pull it out because it was, it was important. And that I would ask questions in the interview about play. And I would sometimes say, what do you know about the NAYC code of ethical conduct? <clears throat> it was an interview question. And yeah. if they didn't know, I'd say, here's your homework, yeah. you know, especially if I wanted to come back for a second interview. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a it's a way to screen out the folks who mm -hmm. may not be a good fit if you're a play based program. But what I found is, boy, my staff got really good at because they couldn't just say they read it they had to practice it yeah yeah and uh, you know and, and it's a living dynamic docu document so for, for people to understand no I don't just read it and then and then file it I'm probably going to have to refer to it and understanding you know as we said before that there and, and you had just uh, uh, noted the responsibilities to children to families to colleagues to community and society and um, they're not all equal you know, particularly the one that Lisa mentioned, above all else, we do no harm. That takes precedence over all other uh, principles and ideals that, that are in the code. Um, and we often, when we're weighing um, uh, the something that the dilemma and something that's been, been happening, that we look and say, well, you know, the most important thing is what we do with young children. So, um, so if I've got two com conflicting pieces going on here, what we do with young children is going to be lifted up. Um, uh, you know, one of the other areas that, and related to play, um, that comes up with, with, uh, with ethics is assessment of young children. Mm -hmm. And so a dilemma that we often see is, and particularly when the national testing movement was happening, that programs were going to, um, some programs were going to norm reference paper and pencil tests where you pull the kid out of the room, you know, and somebody's interviewing the kid and then marking on the little bubble forms what the, what the kid's responses are. Um, now there is, if it's a valid and reliable norm reference instrument and it had been normed with the children in your group, um, to, uh, uh, not the specific children, but you know, if you're teaching that a largely agree. Spanish speaking group, then you've got to have a test that's been norm referenced for Spanish speaking children. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> then, so it's not to say just, just throw them all away, but one of the code uh, principles is that we base our assessments on using multiple sources of information. So if the program says we're using this norm reference tool, then ethically, I need to say, well, we need multiple sources of information. And so we can also use observation and recording of children at play um, as one of the pieces of information. We're going to be collecting work samples. So that's another piece of information that we have. And then we have information from families, from specialists that might have seen the children. So we've got all of this that we're going to put together and analyze. So it's, you know, we are including children at play and we've observed and we're, you know, re recording in a way that is objective, specific, accurate, and complete. Can you tell I've done that training a number of times? Yes. Um, and so we've got this objective information and I'm going to use it all. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's another piece of ethical finesse. The program says we're using the norm reference in instrument. I'm saying, okay, I'll use your instrument. You know, you smile when you say that. Ugh. Love the, love the instrument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll use the instrument. And I'm going to augment it with blah blah blah. Um, so I think that's that's a way to 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 get at that. Um, I, I I hope that it, we're not so crazy about um, testing young children as we were in the past decade. But um, you know, I think it varies from community. Depends on where you are. Yeah. Well, and and the other big piece no, I wanted to bring money. back. I do a a primary grade field work in a class on teaching. A, developmentally appropriate practice or appropriate practices in the primary grade that have active learning and mm -hmm. centers and all of that stuff. 
<clears throat> in Pennsylvania, the the teachers union, of course, has a code of ethical conduct, and and I have students compare because it, it's not as specific as you would wish it was, uh -huh. right? Very interesting. And so I have teachers, students in the classroom compare that one to NAYC, and it is that. And I'll say, which one will you follow? And they go, Oh my God, I got to follow this one because it really lists everything that. I need to be concerned about and aware of in yeah. in any classroom in yeah. working with families with right the regardless of their age yeah regardless yeah. of age yeah and so yeah that is a another way that I sort of sneak in mm -hmm. well <laughs> and the the other thing about our our code and not to disparage codes of other professions but what I do know about our code you know as I mentioned it was 1977 when NAYC first began looking at codes um, and it wasn't until 19 and then there was a statement of commitment in 1985 the board said okay we need an official code of ethical conduct so they asked uh, Dr. Stephanie Feeney who was on the board at the time I believe um, asked her to begin working on this so she was at the University of Hawaii and she uh, spoke with Dr. Ken Kipnis, who was an ethicist, ethicist, um, ethicist at the university, you know, he didn't know from early childhood. Stephanie didn't know much about how codes are, are developed. And so they began with a survey, which they, you know, this is before the internet. So they published it in, in Young Children, a survey, and they asked people, what are issues that come up about uh, doing what is right for your program, and et cetera. And boy, they got a slew of responses by, you know, probably by postal mail at, at, the, at the time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> or some and, buggy. you know, and a, Dr. Kitten, Dr. Kipnis said to uh, Dr. Feeney, he said, your field, they're in ethical pain. <gasps> and, you know, the the biggest issue that came up now, I'm sure you've heard of this, is a parent says to you, I don't want my child to nap at nap time because, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> and she stays up too late and we need her to go to bed earlier. Mm -hmm. Um and so that that is the, oh, the the overarching issue of all, and that you know we're putting okay above all else, do no harm. We know that children need to um, uh, have an amount of rest at a, uh, in a twenty four hour period, and um, but we also know that parents are the primary responsible for child rearing, and so the, our code tells us um, that uh, parents are going to be involved in decisions such as this. Um, in most programs, you can address it with ethical finesse. You know, it's like, okay, well, let him sit on his um, cot and read a book. <laughs> now, most threes and fours I know, as they're sitting there reading the book, they have to fall asleep. So <laughs> and it would be unethical for me to wake him up. So, so that's typically how that, how that is handled. But anyway, uh, that's how the first code was developed through this survey. Um, I got involved, you know, I was using the code when I was uh, teaching, and then I got involved in developing the code um, when I worked at NAYC. And Stephanie Feeney, and then also Nancy Freeman, who was at University of South Carolina, um, the three of us did a traveling show. We went to every conference we could find, and we did sessions on the code. This is what's in the code. What do you think we should change? What changes should be made to the code? Yeah. And that was for the 2005 version. Um, and uh, that was when we added a lot more about assessment because that was a big issue in the mid 2000s. Um, still is. The aughts. The aughts. <laughs> um, and, you know, we also added a core value because there was there was a core value on how you, you, you treat every individual with respect, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in our field, beyond that, we respect diversity and encourage and support diversity. So um, uh, we know that having a, a diverse population diverse uh, ideas and thoughts that enriches the program. So that was added as, as a core value because it came up um, all over the country as, as we were dealing with this. So all I have to say, our code is not, you know, made up by a bunch of pencil pushers, um, like I was, it's, it's made up by people who are in, in, the, in the trenches.
Um, and we did the same thing when we developed two supplements. One is a supplement to the code for program administrators. And the other is a supplement to the code for early childhood adult educators, college faculty and trainers predominantly. Um, and so they were both developed by, again, it was the Stephanie and Peter and Nancy show of traveling around and, and developing this information. The one for adult educators was developed with um, NAECTE, the National Association of Early Childhood Teacher Educators. Mm -hmm. um, so we got just the right people to help to, to develop those. And so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I know we're looking to wrap it up right now, but I'm, I'm going to make a comment based on, again, something you just kind of tossed out there. If this document was created by and for the people doing the profession, I would think that that's a nice entry point of being able to expect that the people are able to align themselves with it, who are in yeah. the profession. Yeah. And I'm curious why it might not be an accreditation criteria that that there's at least people commit to following the code. I mean, you would think that if it was aligned with NAYC, then everything within NAYC's core position statements would have a part and be a part of accreditation. So something for us to think about. As well, I think I think it is, but it's, you know, what I hear you saying is it's probably not as strong as, as uh -huh. we want it to be. And I know for years we, we had said with the uh, NAYC's anti-discrimination uh, position mm -hmm. that we wanted that to be a specific accreditation criteria. And it, mm -hmm. it, it, it hadn't been. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, the so things, I, uh, there's always room for improvement. So things to think about as we move forward in in redesigning or rewriting those position statements. Peter, of course, this has been amazing as always. Stay tuned for just a second while I wrap us up. Thanks, and, Peter. Uh, 